Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. We are going to start in Hebrews 12, verse 1 tonight. And let's see, I'll read out of the KGV first. And I have a couple of other translations I'm going to read out of. Um, but it says, Wherefore, seeing we are also are, are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of of the throne of God, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Um, so I started doing some study in the Greek. I like, I, I'm a nerd like that. I like to go find out the meaning of words. There are synonyms and all that kind of stuff and study things out in the Greek. Um, and I looked up the word for run in the Greek. It's treho which means to obviously run in haste, run in a race, to exert oneself, strive hard to spend one's strength in performing or attaining something. And then this part I thought was really cool. It says that um, this word occurs in Greek writings denoting to incur a extreme peril, which it requires the exertion of all one's efforts to overcome. And um, which, you know, I, I've never heard it quite that way before. You think of, you know, you hear this verse and you think, oh, I'm just going to throw off all the weights that beset me and I'm just going to run my race. But this definition of that word run just kind of put it in a different perspective to, for me. You know, that we are going to incur challenges and um, things that we will face in life, circumstances. But it's putting all of our effort into it and all of what we know about faith and just putting all of our strength into running that race and pushing through past those obstacles to overcome and to win the crown. And um, the word weight in this verse, you know, the first definition of it in the Greek is whatever is prominent. So this can be anything that is prominent in your thought life, in what you're seeing, anything that is more prominent than God's word and his will for your life. And then sin, we all know what sin is. It's, you know, that which is done wrong, sin and offense, a violation of the divine law of God in thought or in act. And then the part that says so easily besets, the Greek word Eupe rustas means skillfully surrounding. The enemy is clever and he is skillful. And he will use whatever means necessary to skillfully surround and entangle you with sins or weights to keep you from finishing the race that is before you. In the Amplified, it tells us in Hebrews um, 12, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore then... Since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses who have borne testimony to the truth, let us strip off and throw aside every encumbrance, unnecessary weight, and that sin which so readily, deftly, and cleverly clings to and entangles us. And let us run with patient endurance and steady and active persistence the appointed course of the race that is set before us, looking away from all that will distract to Jesus, who is the leader and the source of our faith, giving the first incentive for our belief and is also its finisher, bringing it to maturity and perfection. He, for the joy of obtaining the prize that was set before him, endured the cross, despising and ignoring its shame, and is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God, just think of him who endured from sinners such grievous opposition and bitter hostility against himself, reckoning upon and considered it all in 
comparison with your trials, so that you may not grow weary or exhausted, losing heart or re relaxing and fainting in your minds. And then J.B. Phillips says it this way. It says, surrounded then as we are by these serried ranks of witnesses, let us strip off everything that hinders us as well as the sin which dogs at our feet. And let us run the race that we have to run with patience, our eyes fixed on Jesus, the source and the goal of our faith. For he himself endured a cross and thought nothing of its shame because of the joy he knew would, be, would follow his suffering. And he is now seated at the right hand of God's throne, thinking constantly of him, enduring all that sinful men could say against him, and you will not lose your purpose or your courage. So what's keeping you from running? Is it sin that is entangling you? Or is it weights? You know, um, as we talked about earlier, like what are weights? You know, they are things that are prominent in our life, in our thought life, in what we're seeing, circumstances that we're seeing, what we're saying that's prominent over what the word says, anything that is more prominent than God's word and his will for your life is a weight. Weights can be anything from too much entertainment, you know, too much TV or, you know, not spiritual music or anything from doubting and worrying and not living by faith. And they can be the results of failing to abide in God's instructions on Christian living, failing in your love walk, and allowing unforgiveness and bitterness to enter in. Those are things that can result in weights. They can harm you in your spiritual health, and they can harm you physically. They can keep you from running your race. Um, we all know the story that uh, Dad Hagen you know, told many years ago about the woman who had the stomach ailment. And she couldn't eat solid food. I forgot. It was like for many, many years. She couldn't eat solid food. And she went to healing school at Rama, And um, God spoke to her, ministered to her about forgiveness. And she was walking in unforgiveness. And so she went across the street to what used to be the Monterey House back in those days. And um, she got on the, the payphone and called her brother up and they couldn't even, got around to it, they couldn't even remember what they were mad with each other about. It had been so long, and they had been walking in unforgiveness for so long, she had this physical ailment in her body because of her unforgiveness. So long story short, they end up forgiving each other on the phone right then and there, and she goes in the restaurant and eats spicy Mexican food, and it was the first solid food she'd had in years and kept it down. And um, some people out at Rama that were around during that time, they said if you ever ate at the Monterey house, that you would have to have been supernaturally healed for it not to bother your stomach. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but anyway, that just goes to show weights and sins, weights like unforgiveness and bitterness can harm you not just in your spiritual walk, but they can harm you physically too. Um, but, you know, we're dealing more with the weights that beset us. And... Um, you know, when you find strength and freedom to run your race, when you allow the love of God and forgiveness to work through you, to work in you and to work through you, you'll be empowered to run your race. Um, one of my, I'm going to share, this is going to take a little bit of time, but I'm going to share, this is one of my favorite stories on forgiveness. Um, and it is about a woman named Corey Ten Boone, who was a Christian, during the Holocaust, during World War II, she lived in Harlem, Netherlands, which is, it's kind of, a, I think it's kind of like a, a suburb of Amsterdam. But she was a Christian, and she, um, her father was a watchmaker, and she was, I think she was in her 40s when World War II happened. But um, they actually built a secret room. She has a book called The Hiding Place. And they built a secret room that was 30 inches deep that they built like a wall, um, a fake wall, and had this where you had to like go down on your hands and knees and kick this little like door out and crawl in there to hide when like a raid would happen in the night 
with the Nazis. And um, they had a ventilation system in there, and you know they had it like they had to sneak bricks in with uh, like briefcases rolled up in newspapers and all this kind of stuff to build this secret hiding place. And so the Nazis actually came and raided the house. They had heard that they were hiding Jews, but they couldn't find proof. And they raided the house in 1944. There were six people hiding in that 30-inch deep space that was the size of a, um, like a wardrobe, like a medium-sized wardrobe. So her, her father, her elderly father, and her sister were arrested and taken to um, a camp. Her dad died like 10, you know, 10 days after being in the camp. And then her and her sister were taken to Ravensbrück, which was a concentration camp outside of Berlin. And um, it was so dark during that time that 80 people died each day in that camp when she was living there. And uh, so anyway, her sister ended up dying December 16th of 1944. And then she got released December 28th of 1944. And it was a clerical error that allowed her to get released. A few months later, the Russians were coming into the camp and um, to liberate it. And so the Germans found out and sent almost 25,000 prisoners out on a death march to wipe out any witnesses. So she believes that it was a God-ordained mistake in her life that allowed her to escape and to tell her story. Um, so anyway, she went on to, when the war ended, you know, she had lost all of her family. She had suffered so much during the camp. And when the war ended, God called her to go to Germany and be a missionary to Germany. And the very people that imprisoned her and wiped out her family. Um, and the, the Jews that they were hiding actually lived. They, they were never discovered when they were in the hiding place, which is kind of cool that her family sacrificed their lives pretty much to protect six Jewish people that ended up to li living and were never discovered by Nazis. But years down, a few years down the road, so God called her back to Germany in 1946, and she, this is her speaking. She says, um, it was 1947, and I'd come from Holland to defeated Germany with the message that God forgives. It was the truth that they needed most to hear in that bitter, bombed-out land. And I gave them my favorite mental picture, maybe because the sea is never far from a Hollander's mind. I f like to think that that's where forgiven sins are thrown. When we confess our sins, I said, God cast them into the deepest ocean, gone forever. And even though I can't find it in a scripture for it, I believe God then places a sign out there that says, no fishing allowed. The solemn faces stared back at me, not quite daring to believe. And that's when I saw him, working his way forward against the others. One moment I saw the overcoat with the brown hat, the next a blue uniform and a cap with a skull and crossbones. It came back with a rush. The huge room with its harsh overhead lights, the pathetic pile of dresses and the shoes in the center of the floor, the shame of walking naked past the man, I could see my sister's frail form ahead of me, ribs sharp beneath parchment skin. She said that, was, that place was Ravensbrook, and the man who was making his way forward had been a guard, one of the most cruel guards. Now he was in front of me, hand thrust out, a fine message, Fräulein, how good it is to know that, as you say, all our sins are at the bottom of the sea. And I, who had spoken so glibly of forgiveness, fumbled in my pocketbook rather than take his hand. He would not remember me, of course. How could he remember one prisoner among thousands of women? But I remember him. It was a face-to-face -face with one of my captors, and my blood seemed to freeze. You mentioned Ravensbrook in your talk. He was saying, I was a guard there. No, he did not remember me. But since that time, he went on, I have become a Christian. I know that God has forgiven me for the cruel things I did there, but I would like to hear it from your lips as well, Fräulein. Again, the hand came out. Will you forgive me? 
As I stood there, I whose sins had again and again been forgiven and could not forgive. Betsy had died in that place. Could he erase her slow, terrible death simply for the asking? I could not have been many, se- it could not have been many seconds that he stood there, hand held out, but to me it seemed like hours as I wrestled with the most difficult thing I had ever had to do. For I had to do it. I knew that. The message that God forgives has a prior condition, that we forgive those who have injured us. If you do not forgive men their trespasses, Jesus said, neither will your Father in heaven forgive you your trespasses. And still I stood there with the coldness clutching my heart. But forgiveness is not an emotion. I knew that too. Forgiveness is an act of the will, and the will can function regardless of the temperature of the heart. Jesus, help me, I prayed silently. I can lift my hand. I can do that much. You supply the feeling. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust out my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then this healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother. I cried with all my heart. For a long moment, we grasped each other's hands, the former guard and the former prisoner. I had never known God's love so intensely as I did then. But even then, I realized it was not my love. I had tried and did not have the power. It was the power of the Holy Ghost. So, you know, she was faced with this person who had done so much harm to her, and she had a decision to make. You know, she could continue and walk in unforgiveness and bitterness and probably thwart the plan of God on her life, or she could choose the path of forgiveness and allow God to work through her, his love to work through her, and to equip her and help strengthen her to be able to walk out that forgiveness towards someone who had caused her so much harm. So we cannot allow weights like unforgiveness, bitterness, anything like that. We can not allow weights to hinder us from running our race. We have such an amazing purpose ahead of us. We, and we cannot allow the enemy to succeed in his attempts to weigh us down with hurts, with sickness, um, with unforgiveness, offense, vain arguments, or attempts to try and prove that you can do something that isn't fully a sin. That's a big thing right now. Um, all the things that would entangle us and cause us to stumble because we'll get, it'll get us off course. I know so many people who get caught up in that, um, in, in either offense or trying to, you know, these vain arguments of trying to prove that they can do this or that, and they get off track. And there's someone that had such a purpose and a call on their life, and then you see where they are all these years later, and you're like, oh, you know, like, if you had just allowed God's word to be prominent in your thoughts and allowed his word to be supreme and not your little, you know, soapbox, your little thing that you just had to stand by no matter what the cost. If you had allowed God's word to be prominent, it wouldn't have weighed you down, those weights of allowing whatever it was being prominent in your thought life. Okay? So um, all the things that would entangle us and cause us to stumble and get us off course, we have to throw them away. You know, I fully believe that if Corey Ten Boone had not walked in forgiveness, she would have probably gone off course, and she, she wouldn't be the person she became to be. I mean, she's, she ended up writing several books. She died at 91 years old, you know, lived a full life, was a preacher, a spirit-filled preacher. You know, she believed in speaking in tongues and all that stuff, you know, that, that we adhere to, and... Um, but I believe wholeheartedly if she had allowed unforgiveness to enter into her heart that she would have gotten off course and would not be where she ended up being and running her race out to the fullness. Um, There's something to be said of walking in love and our love walk and the importance. And the Bible says the greatest of these is love. So there's a purpose to love and there's a purpose in walking in love and it should be you know, what reigns in our hearts and in in everything we do and in our actions. It should be a prominent part of our, our walk and running the race. 
All right, so um, 2, Corinth, or 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 8, I'm going to read it in the Amplified. It says, herald and preach the word. Keep your sense of urgency. Stand by, be at hand and ready. Whether the opportunity seems to be favor favorable or unfavorable, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, whether it is welcome or unwelcome, you as a preacher of the word are to show people in a way, in what way their lives are wrong and convince them, rebuking and correcting, warning and urging and encouraging them, being unf unflagging and inexhaustible and in patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not tolerate, endure, sound and wholesome instruction, but having itching ears for, some, for something pleasing and gratifying, they will gather to themselves one teacher after another to a considerable number, choosing to satisfy their own liking and to foster the errors they hold. And they will turn aside from hearing the truth and wander off into myths and man-made fictions. As for you, be calm and cool and steady. Accept and suffer unflinchingly every hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fully perform all the duties of your ministry. For I am already about to be sacrificed. My life is about to be poured out as a drink offering. The time of my spirit's release from, from the body is at hand. And I will soon go free. I have fought the good, worthy, honorable, and noble fight. I have finished the race. I have kept firmly held the faith as to what remains henceforth there is laid up for me the victor's crown of righteousness for being right with God and doing right which is which is which the Lord the righteous judge will award to me and and recompense me on that great day and not only to me but also to all those who have loved and yearned for and welcomed his appearing, his return. You know, I love Paul, like, I love his grasp right here on, you know, like, I have not failed to do this. I have finished my race. And I hope that it is said of us when we get to the end that we can say, you know what? I finished my race. I ran my course. I did all that I was called to do. And that, you know, we can have that confidence that we are going to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Um, 1 Corinthians 9.24 says, Do you not know that the, the, in a race all runners compete, but only one receives the prize? So run your race that you may lay hold of the prize and make it yours. All right? There's an action involved. Faith is an act. You know, and, and walking in love is an act. All those things are an act. Running the race is an act like we talked about earlier you know that there's going to be perils that come circumstances that come but you have to choose to push through those things and to overcome those things and to run your race and to do it with all your might all that's in you everything that has been put into you by the word through teaching through under pastor you know all that's been put into you just let it rise up in you and be your strength that carries you through to the end. Amen? All right, Philippians 3, 12 through 14 in the Amplified. I love the Amplified, in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> um, not that I have now attained this ideal or have already been made perfect, but I press on to lay hold of grasp and make my own. It says that a lot, make it my own. That for which Christ Jesus, the Messiah, has laid, laid hold of me and made me his own. I do not consider, brethren, that I have captured and made it my own. Yet, but one thing I do, it is my one aspiration, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press toward the goal to win the supreme and heavenly prize to which God in Christ Jesus is calling us upward. Okay, so the race demands that we do, do away with everything that hinders us. Sin, whatever else threatens our relationship with God, weights, 
whatever's prominent in our thought life, that we throw it away, that we get rid of it, and we cast it aside, and we push forward. We, you know, as this said, this verse we just let, read a minute ago, it says straining forward to what lies ahead. Okay, so it's not going to be, you know, like some people say, it's an effortless, it's an effortless life. Everything I read in the Bible tells me it's straining, it's pushing, you know, it's fighting the good fight. And fighting the, I, don't, I mean, I don't know where you come from, but a fight involves effort. <laughs> Amen. All right, so anything that will slow us down or trip us up must be cast off. And it doesn't have to be some, like, crazy extreme sin to get you off course. There's other, you know, like we talked about, there's weights. There's things, just small things, sometimes lead to big things. And so you have to watch those small things that try to slip in and get you off course a little here and there a little. Like Pastor talked about, the minister that was in school with him. You know, someone that I once looked up to, you know, and he got off a little over here. And he got off a little over here, and now he's like, I dabble in, you know, I'm a Christian, but I dabble in Buddhism, and I dabble in this and that, and he's holding, like, you know, nightclub parties in his church, <laughs> in his church. <laughs> so, you know, we don't want to let those little weights and those little hindrances entangle us and get us off course, all right? So anything that will slow us down or trip us up must be cast off. The Apostle Paul says to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, and to be made new in the attitude of your minds, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24 says, Strip yourselves of your former nature, Put off and discard your old, unrenewed self, which is characterized your pre which characterized your previous manner of life, and becomes corrupt through lusts and desires that spring from delusion, and be constantly, constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude and put on the new nature that regenerates itself, created in God's image, God-like in true righteousness and holiness. So it's a continual act. We have to put on the new nature. You know, it's a continual fight. It's a continual race. It's something that's going to be continued for the rest of our lives on this earth. But thank God he's equipped us and empowered us to be able to do that. Amen? So with the encouragement of those who have gone before us, we need to rid ourselves of thoughts, attitudes, and habits that will impede our progress and finishing our race. Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, which is so messed up today. <laughs> but be fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its, uh, its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. And then Titus 3.3 3 says, For we are also... We also were once thoughtless and senseless, obstinate and disobedient, deluded and misled. We too once were slaves to all sorts of cravings and pleasures, wasting our days in malice and jealousy and envy, hateful, hatred, detestable, and hating one another. That's what we once were, okay? That's not who we are today. That shouldn't be who we are today. And then 1 Peter 1.14 says, Live as children of obedience to God. Do not conform yourselves to the evil desires that governed you in your former ignorance when you did not know the requirements of the gospel. Allow his word to work in you and to equip you to set off those weights, those sins, 
so they won't entangle you so that you can continue to run the race that's set before you. If you go further down in Hebrews 12 to verse 11 through 16, it says, For the time being, no discipline brings joy, but seems grievous and painful. But afterwards, it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it, a harvest of fruit which consists in righteousness, in conformity to God's will, in purpose, thought, and action, resulting in living right and right standing with God. So then, brace up and reinvigorate and set right your slackened and weakened and drooping hands and strengthen your feebled and palsied and tottering knees and cut through and make firm and plain and smooth straight paths for your feet Yes, make them safe and upright and happy paths that go in the right direction so that the lame and halting limbs may not be put out of joint but rather may be cured. Strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that concentration, consecration and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Exercise foresight And be on the watch to look after one another, to see that no one falls back from and fails to secure God's grace, his unmerited favor and spiritual blessing, in order that no root of resentment, rancor, bitterness, or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment, and the many become contaminated and defiled by it that no one may become guilty of sexual vice or become a profane, godless, and sacrilegious person as Esau did, who sold his own birthright for a single meal. Okay, so tonight, my question for you is, will you run? Will you run your race that's set before you? Will you run the course with the church and pastor? Will you run what God has for you in your life? Or will you slowly, you know, go along and carry your bags of hurt and unforgiveness and bitterness and sin and weights and other sins that are skillfully trying to surround you? Or will you throw it all off and will you run? Okay? So that is my message to you tonight, is will you run? Amen? All right. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.